Hello, welcome to Poetry Square. I'm Diane Funston. I'm a Yuba Sutter Arts and Cultures poet in residence. And welcome, welcome to Poetry Square, where every month we have four poets who read, myself and three guests. And tonight we have three uh, poets who are all in California. Many times we have East Coast and other areas of California. This time we're all coming from the Sacramento Valley. But uh, I thought I would start us off with reading and um, this one, kind of a, a hopeful poem, I hope. It's, it's called Downward Siphon. Downward Siphon. The siphon sucks the aquarium water down into a waiting red plastic bucket. Green algae liquid fills the container as the debris from the bottom travels through coils of tubing like tiny riders of modern roller coasters. After each full trough they empty onto summer thirsty roses, vegetables, shrubs, the waste of fauna becomes food for flora in a cycle of giving and receiving. Plants stand taller and open after their drink. Fish swim with renewed vitality after replaced water. Gratitude comes in the growth of both recipients. A wish here for the case of humanity where too often one takes and doesn't give, and some starve for the measured growth of others. And this one um, is called A Walk in the Woods. I love to walk in the woods. I love the green and nature. And this is kind of an homage to that, A Walk in the Woods. Cathedral Grove. The trailhead narthex beckons us farther in to silent sanctuary. Take the trail, go forward lightly. No turning back, no standing still. Covering ground, airy ferns glisten bright green. Spider splayed fronds hold like fingers to forest floor. We are an afterthought at the foot of these ancients. We look upward toward canopy, toward eternity, and inward toward ourselves. And uh, one of the successes that we've had, of course, in California is the reintroduction of the condor. And when I lived in Tehachapi, California, which is up in the mountains, uh, about an hour away from Bakersfield, uh, they released some of the condors into our area. And this is an unfortunate story of one condor with the band number AC8. Adult condor number eight shot dead in a mountain town 200 miles from where she was released. 14 chicks whose wings beat over canyons crested by proud peaks and under springtime skies, gray-black wings, funeral shrouds for a mother wasted by an illegal shot. Protection not a guarantee against gray-black guns aiming for fun at a buzzard by the back gate. Adult condor number eight lies still against limestone dust, ground down for cement. She will be erased from research logs and the metal band is cut from her leg. She will be erased from the sky and the nest, no longer adding young to increasing numbers. Adult, adult condor number eight, too late to feather your future. And uh, I guess this would apply a little bit today where we're having a lot of needed rain. And this is called Atmospheric River. And this was a couple of years ago when we had record setting rain in Northern California. Atmospheric River. Walking in Northern California rain 
snug under a plastic poncho. I'm bothered neither by wet or wind. Brave dogs at my side. We straddle puddles and gutters to get our daily exercise, despite downpours 10 days out. Our snowpack is secure after years of drought and dust. Forecast calls for atmospheric river, the latest in dramatic terms to excite the media addicted sedentary class. I continue my walk, tree limbs wave, our pace reflected in standing water. I do welcome the rain though, it just sounds wonderful on the roof. And since I'm newer to the area, it's uh, six years this year, I really enjoy um, the winters that we have here in our Mediterranean climate. And the petunias, one of my favorite flowers that just grow year round. And so this is uh, petunias. Pink petunias comfort without attempting to preach when the blossoms loosened by wind quiver or the petals or the stamen whisper then release. The garden becomes silent as soil skilled hands reach upward to pick a bouquet. And uh, you can tell I'm a gardener and this is called Garden View. Clinton Avenue dead ends now into a parking lot for surplus goods. The old neighborhood looms ahead, older now, some four decades, but I look for you in the garden. The snapdragons, poppies, and petunias I planted with you when I was a toddler are gone. Yellow clapboards you painted peek out from under split aluminum siding that was meant to make a maintenance-free home. Where is my home now? East Coast, West Coast, Center City, Rural Town. You were confident and planted seeds. I do not trust and grow houseplants. Your soil-packed fingers guided me forward. Later, I held your blue hand rigid on grandma's green recliner. I still weep. Every morning I deadhead petunias, remembering what you taught me, grandfather. In our neighborhood, the painted yellow house, the front yard garden, and no sign of surplus goods. And this one is called Hands. Um, I always am kind of accused of carrying too many things at once and my hands are always full. And this is a little bit about the different meanings of that. Hands. My hands are always full. Coffee cups, room clearing clutter, the picking up from others, or even notice that things are in the way. My hands were always full, a single parent to three boys, even though I was married, to a live-in unconcerned husband. My heart was full then too, keeping the facade of his love intact. Now my hands are too busy, sorting for a move back to a home rebuilt from fire that keeps and the donates the who I was 14 months ago and the who I am in current form, at times a chasm apart. Hands busy too with emails, texts, the need to know immediacy, technology way ahead of my preferred speed of living. Nowhere to hide because of course, we're all home during pandemic time out. My head is busy on overload, creativity challenges practicality, solitude loses to family, quiet is interrupted from everywhere. I keep my hands busy too, to ward off anxiety of the times, 
no longer able to give or receive hugs. High fives, holding another's hand as we remain hidden with no place to hide and all the time to be there. And this is a poem called Roots. I like my roots to tangle, tributaries from the tap root down deep, divining rods to nourishment, but change, that constant companion, kept close ties this year. The pruning loss, at first devastating, forced new shoots to grow. Like an inexperienced rose gardener, in awe of how quickly wounds heal and spring forth with new life, I too stood amazed at possibility, gain accomplished only by losing everything almost. We came through the conflagration, the enraged herd of confusion looked towards home, that place you still have the key for, surrounded by rivers and rice, orchards and suburbia, roots again reach down, sprouts grow through scars, life possible again. A house is just a house, home is where we thrive, stretch the limbs, become green again, blood pulsating, mind awake, growing back home. And uh, this is called In the Garden. In the garden, surrounded by orchards and rice fields, we planted lemons, oranges, pomegranates, and figs, and enough foliage to shelter us from the reality of city living. Shrubs grew high, vines entwined. We grew poetry in the petunias picked words from the cauliflower, untangled good lines from night blooming jasmine. You said, carve me and you inside a heart on a tree. We have plenty. I said, cleave onto me in the bushes under cover of twilight. We embraced and became one between the redwood tree and massive fig we have marked this place as ours, deep in the foliage from the reality of city living. And now I'm going to turn it over to Roger Funston, um, who will read you some of his own poetry. Hi everyone, I'm Roger Funston, and uh, I hang out with Diane uh, in Marysville. And so uh, um, the first set of poems I'm gonna read are about um, my my outdoors, walking in, in nature and, uh, the, and natural world in special places. Woods Wandering, early morning in the woods, Moisture still clinging to the leaves from rainfall the night before. Moss spreading on the tree trunks, fungi carpeting the forest floor. Wind whooshing, grass swaying, trees creaking. Layers worn to protect against the cold. The coolness on my face makes me feel alive. My racing mind quieted for a moment, listening to my breath. Condensation hovering around my mouth as I exhale. The rhythmic crunching as wandering feet travel along a trail of small gravel and earth. A walking meditation. Steam rising from plants warmed by the sun, songbirds twittering, squirrels scurrying, newts lounging, a woodpecker's rhythmic pounding, the distant sound of a roaring creek getting louder as I approach, the air caressing my skin as I peel off layers. I hike nearly every day, often returning to the same trails, seeing something new every time, usually a small spot with an interesting texture captured by light and shade in a certain way. 
I am grateful to have wonderful spots so close by and the freedom in retirement to wander in awe. Mexican Ocelot. This is about a, I was a volunteer on a research project in Mexico. I walk through dry tropical rainforest over hills, valleys, steep canyons, setting and baiting live traps, tracking your movements, trying to solve the puzzle of where you prefer to prowl. Most days the traps are empty. Some mornings we find you in the trap, excited to see you, but saddened that it must be through a cage. You are a magnificent creature. We tranquilize you, wait for you to slumber, measure you, record your spotting pattern, unique for each of you. We touch your fur through the cage, watch you groggily awaken, make sure you have recovered. You stagger at first, but soon regain your senses, dashing back into your world. For millennia, you and your ancestors have lived and died in this dry rainforest, one of the rarest ecosystems, looking almost like Southern California chaparral in January, flooded and verdant in July, but planned development will slice through your jungle. Surely we can take the time to understand your harsh but fragile world. Leave the best spots for you before taking the rest to carve up for roads and resorts. The next poem is uh, about Baba Lane Preserve um, along the Feather River, a, a place I enjoy going to very much. Baba Lane. Within minutes, I have left Marysville behind, an ever-changing black cloud of geese hovering over flooded rice fields, orchards nourished by river water rooted in fine alluvial soil. Seasonally flooded Baba Lane Preserve, lovingly managed by Audubon, rare remnant of riparian forest, oak woodland, grasslands, sloughs, lakes, hugging the floodplain of the Feather River, home to black crowned night herons, wood ducks, beavers, river otters, swains, and hawks. Rhythmic walking along the shady trail, filtered sunlight accenting the textured bark of trees, branches and leaves illuminated against the sky, sparkling water surfaces seen through forest openings, shady dry channels choked with vegetation, the odd shapes of bits of downed trees. Forest to meadow to forest, cool shade, then warm sun against my skin. Bird songs fill the air, the gentle rustling of tree branches. Subtle scenes catch my eye, smells, sights, sounds filling my body and soul on my all too brief escape from urban hubris. Next poem is called uh, Saving the Redwoods. And the epithet for this poem is, one generation plants trees so that the next generation has shade. It's an old Chinese proverb. Saving the Redwoods. It started with a simple premise. Some places on earth are so special, they deserve to be saved like any work of art, set aside for our grandchildren's grandchildren. In 1917, the Redwood Highway was completed, opening up far north coastal California to more and more logging to sate the appetite of a growing state for wood. A group of men came to the Redwoods, witnessed devastation at a time when forests were only seen as wood, when the resource seemed inexhaustible. Awestruck by the beauty and serenity, they removed their hats and spoke in whispers, in God's church that day, they each committed $100 to save these trees. These founders of Save the Redwood League prevailed on all those who had the money to buy a grove, the only reward a legacy, dedicating the grove to the person of their choice. They saved the trees one grove at a time, eventually a thousand groves destined to become the crown jewels of the California State Park System. The spark igniting this lasting legacy not initially conceived by government, but by the passion and persistence of individuals willing to work 40 years to acquire Avenue of the Giants. Thanks to the vision of these early 20th century men, I can stand alongside the world's tallest trees, 
Watch the sunlight filter through an ancient forest onto a forest floor filled with ferns and sorrel. I hear the sounds of silence, feel the cool, damp air against my face. A calmness settles over me, quieting my active mind. This next poem is a uh, um, thinking about when I'm going to be 85, what I'll be doing walking. When I'm 85, I will walk the dogs on a late fall day along a trail that follows a dry creek through an oak woodland. A few yellow leaves clinging to bare branches after the fall color display. Snow veneer from recent storms lying along the creek bed. The sound of birds filling the air. I will walk in the late afternoon, look down at mountain lion footprints and soft earth, watch for bobcat moving through boulders, the sun sinking towards the horizon, casting an orange glow on gray clouds, the last blush of light. I will walk the land as seasons change, the light in the hills green by spring snowstorms, be lulled by the melody of flowing water in spring-fed creeks, smell the dust and feel the warmth of summer days, seek the cool shadows under oak canopy, look in awe at fall's burst of colors, watch the silhouette of bare branches against a deep blue sky, feel the briskness of winter's chill. In the late fall days of my life, I will seek solace in nature. I will be grateful, I will be joyful. I will keep laughing, I will keep loving, I will keep moving. The next poem is a, I guess you'd call it a Kodak moment driving in the desert called Desert's Day End. The setting sun casts a warm glow over snow-capped peaks, illuminating delicate designs between jagged edges sculpted over eons by wind, water, and ice. A kaleidoscope of swirling snowflakes deflected around my windshield, frost-covered sagebrush, frozen soils. The frigid air chills my cheeks. As I speed down the highway, heading home past endless vistas, the desert disappears into darkness. And the last poem about special places, this is a, a visit we, we made to the whole rainforest. Arriving at the rainforest hoe, expecting quiet, but wouldn't you know, people, people everywhere, voices filling up the air, came to see some forest green, walking in a place serene. I just want to take it in, but can't escape the constant din. Surrounded by a bunch of tourists taking snapshots in the forest. Selfie sticks held in the air, aiming at a face so fair. Teenagers talking, talking, talking. I stop hoping they'll keep walking. Tr try to walk at my own pace. Others must be in a race. I understand it's Labor Day, but this is what I have to say. Heading back to cabin retreat, our private rainforest can't be beat. This next set of poem are about uh, uh, families and experiences and feelings. Um, and this first poem is called Grandpa Saturdays. He is dressed in blue blazer, dress shirt frayed, stained gray slacks, bad haircut, stubbly beard, vacant look. The monotony of the facility, the loss of independence, scheduled showers three days a week. He is able to walk still, comes and goes, sneaking in brown paper bags, alcohol his only friend for dulling depression's pain. 20 years ago, he was full of life. He used to walk so fast I could barely keep up. Every Saturday, I had barbecue beef sandwiches and lemon meringue pie. He had coffee and pie, rolled a mean backhand at the bowling alley. Root beer floats made with secret ingredients, cards dealt from the bottom of the deck so I could win. He thought I didn't know, but I knew, I knew. I hear the slur in his voice when I call. I think he knows who I am, but I'm not sure. I want to be there for him, repay him for his love at a time when this was scarce and put downs plentiful. But I am 1,200 miles away, 
beginning my career rise as he slides towards his de demise. My next poem, um, we used to do dog rescue. This is about one of our rescue dogs uh, that we fostered. Sad Shadow. He stands, still and stoic, rescued from homelessness from the brink of starvation. This sad shadow quietly walks up to me, quivering question mark tail, waiting for me to pet his gray snout and coarse fur filled with healing sores. Inside scars remain. The other dogs invite him to play, but he is still haunted by memories of life sleeping under cars and cruel men with raised arms, moves quickly out of my way to avoid my accidental misstep. Only recently experiencing the kindness of gentlemen and comforts of sleeping on a chair, I am drawn to this underdog and long to help him heal. This is a uh, pre-COVID poem when I was working called Lazy Weekend. It used to be so important to stuff as much as possible into a weekend after sitting in an office all week, full calendars, endless meetings, idiot bosses, unproductive nonsense. Now a lazy weekend is perfectly fine, leisurely breakfast watching our million dollar view, birds at the feeder, walking the dogs, bopping around town, watching a movie, reading, afternoon love making, napping, love, sp love spending time with you. My four month sabbatical has been mostly wonderful, sometimes frustrating and disappointing, thinking about what is really important, finding out who are my real friends, a balanced life filled with community, poetry, live music, photography, travel, perhaps learning to play a musical instrument, open areas, room to roam to suffer the hassles of relocation or stay put at any cost, the uncertainty, the waiting, none of this entirely within my control, learning to go with the flow, but all this angst and overthinking can wait until Monday because today I am having a lazy day. And my last poem um, is called uh, Day in Family Court. Got to court at half past eight, Lawyer told me, don't be late. Benches outside, courtroom filled, lots of clients to be billed. Man up front directing flow, telling people where to go. Lots of time to look around, lawyers nowhere to be found. People huddled in the halls, some on cell phones making calls, others planning out the day, all the drama on display. Lawyers striding, show no shame, confident in courtroom games. Not a thing for them at stake, another day of give and take. At long last, my, my lawyer shows, X with her lawyer is in tow. Squeeze into a tiny room, talking, talking, feeling doom. Today we will not agree, my day in court will not be. Once again, court date delays. That's okay, the client pays. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. I'm Diana Medina. Um, I'm so excited to be here with you all today. And yeah, I am uh, grabbing my poetry here. Um, so uh, the first couple of poems uh, I want to share are, um, I do a lot of writing trying to, I guess poetry is the way I try to process things that have happened to me or make sense of things. Um, it's also, I'm not a religious person, but I find poetry is like my favorite way to have conversations with God or to imagine what conversations with God would sound like if I could have them. Uh, so some poems are about that. So I'll start with this one, which is called Walking in Flight. After years of walking through path after path of dense dark forest, just before I was beginning to question whether or not I'm actually loved by God, I finally saw something that didn't look like an obstacle on the horizon. It was an isolated mountain wearing a crown of clouds off in the distance. It was standing there majestic, high up over the trees and rocks that protect its base. 
choir of birds with wings extended passed over my head as I admired it. They were gliding as the wind carried them lovingly towards the peak. They looked patient, way more patient than I would be on such a flight. Every time God tells me to keep walking towards that peak, I'm a little angry. Why can't I just get there already? Why do you keep sending me on these painful detours? When will I finally be able to arrive and wash the dirt off my dusty pink cheeks? I am so tired of looking like a hot brown mess. Why can't I just get there and feast my eyes on the beautiful view that those birds get to see on their journey? God smiles at me lovingly, wiping the dirt off my cheeks and says, because my child, you are not a bird. This walk is the way you fly. Um, this next one is uh, based on a uh, incident I had with a with my big brother. So I am the youngest of eight children and uh, have regularly uh, used poetry to process some of the weird childhood memories and uh, mean spirited pranks that my brothers would play on me. So this is one of those. It's called Inner Child. My inner child is still pissed off about my brother scaring me the day before my first day of kindergarten. He told me the teacher would shoot me if I didn't know the Pledge of Allegiance by heart. He took me aside to help me practice. He said the teachers would carry guns in their fanny packs. And when the English words felt too heavy for my tongue to hold, he'd pull out his pretend finger gun and say, boom. I believed him. On my first day of school, I was so terrified, I tried to escape and got stuck in a hole in the fence. I cried when they got me out of it. The teachers got me unstuck and walked me into a classroom, and I sat on the carpet shaking and thinking I'd be dead soon. A little boy named Charlie sat next to me. He held my hand as I cried. He kept saying, don't worry, I'm with you. He told me that every day that week when I would cry. Adult me tells my inner child it's okay. I say, our brother didn't know what he was talking about. Look at us, we didn't die, we have two degrees now. Then I agree to play Tetris with her while eating Lucky Charms later. Unlike my parents, adult me can't afford to buy her all the sugary breakfast cereals she wants. Yeah, that one is uh, interesting since it, was, it happened way before some of these incidents with um, you know, school shootings and things, but it is, it is definitely, um, it was definitely a mean-spirited prank that uh, I regularly remind my brother about. Um, and yeah, and that little boy, Charlie, was a really great friend for me that he was the first friend I ever made. And so we stayed friends all through elementary school, which was also really nice. Um, this next poem is called Heal Me Faster. I am in a hurry to heal and afraid at the same time being paralyzed by fear and worry about what is waiting on the other side of healing really sucks. Contrary to what spiritual Instagram posts would have you believe, awakenings are sloppier and dustier than cleaning out a cluttered garage. I know there's a goddess in me somewhere, but what am I supposed to do when some days that goddess doesn't want to shower or eat or put on pants or go to work? There's no filter that speeds up this process. There's only waiting. And when you're in a hurry to heal, you are stuck waiting between fear and worry. Everything sucks. Life is stuck in a boomerang loop, going from one to the other over and over. Instead of patiently waiting for healing, you tighten your grips around your hurt. You retreat into a suffocating sphere of your inner influence because having control there is better than waiting. You are way too hurt and too anxious to be patient too tired to be resilient and too annoyed to wait for your blessings. You want them all and you want them fast. God looks at your tantrum smiling and says, that's nice. Um, yeah, so those are my childhood slash conversation with God poems. Um, I recently also have been experimenting with writing poetry about pop culture and things that are going on in the news. And so when the, um, uh, Oprah interview that she did with uh, um, Megan and Harry about the royal family and then leaving the royal family. I got very interested. I fell down a rabbit hole of information and then wrote a few poems about that stuff. So here's a few about my processing of the royal family 
uh, drama and scandal. Um, this first one is called Who Saved Who? It seems to me that maybe Megan saved Harry. Maybe his desire to run from royal duties to spend his days worshiping this mixed race queen is his idea of heaven. I bet she makes his brain and body come with the same intensity. Maybe she saved him from a family who failed him the way they failed his mother all those years ago. Maybe there are better things to aspire to in life than fulfilling archaic family obligations. Toxic cycles only end when someone decides to walk away. If that isn't an improved fairy tale ending, I don't know what is. This next one is uh, called Royal Family on the same theme here. Just like Game of Thrones, but with more psychological warfare, way more cameras and not a single dragon, just patriarchy, power, colonialism, dressing themselves in white spandex and making packs with tabloids to play fight like wrestlers to entertain the masses. Some are faces, some are heels, some are trapped. All of them are in on it. And uh, this next one is called Princess Diana. Oh, I lost my place, there we go. What did I know at 19? Wounding ourselves to make others proud is all we know how to do at that age. We were raised on diets of obligation and tradition. We know what it's like to be starved for love. How many of us have been naive sacrificial lambs turned problematic black sheep after our awakening? There was champagne named after your daddy and it's a boy chance in the streets the night you birthed another zombie for their male chauvinist colonial machine. I wonder if you heard them. Maybe that's why they called you determined and domineering, simply for having personal boundaries. The cameras that hunted you replaced flashes with gaslight before you realized you weren't crazy. They were. Girl, the same shit happened to me yesterday. Um, that one was inspired after I watched a uh, documentary about Princess Diana and just realized how young she was. I was very um, taken aback by just all of that um, story. Um, this next one to shift gears a little bit is, um, again, I also use uh, poetry a lot to process kind of interesting conversations or things I learned about. And I started to try to wonder about past lives and uh, whether those are a thing and what they mean. Um, so this one is about that and it's called Alma's Passport. A past life is like your soul's passport. Your body is the travel vessel. This life, your life is the vacation you are going on together. This moment is your awakening. Let's call your soul Alma. This passport shows you where Alma has been. It gives you context for where you can go to heal your things and also visit her things. Sometimes her things will look like your things. When that happens, that's a repeating pattern, like eating at different restaurants, but always ordering the same mistake. This passport is like a divine guidebook to plan the eternal vacation that is your life. Alma's passport is like a treasure map. It is Yelp, Craigslist, Amazon, Groupon, karmic online banking, a dating app, and a flashlight all rolled into one. Trauma is like sharing a suitcase with Alma. Sometimes Alma leaves her used underwear in there. You don't have to wear them, but you should make sure to wash them with yours because eventually you will end up wearing them by accident. Um, this next poem is called Rubbing Lotion on My Skin. So again, I always like to um, explore writing poetry about everyday experiences and, and trying to find the poetry in moments. Um, so this was one where uh, I somebody challenged me to write a poem about rubbing lotion on my skin. So this is what I came up with. When I do it, I imagine I am marinating myself in softness. When this creamy substance seeps into my pores, I hope it makes me taste more tender and smell more sweet. I want it to make me fall off my own bones so my lovers can make meals out of me. I hope eventually it makes someone think I feel like a place they can call home. I do it so much my shadow and reflection have become jealous they can't touch me. If the only hands that ever touch me this way are my own, I hope they will always be friendly. I am tired of enduring harm by my own hands. 
tired of parts of my skin feeling foreign, no longer wanting to be a stranger to myself. I want these hands, my hands, to hold me, to love every curve and crevice on this body until my spirit becomes one with my skin. Doing it now is like rubbing prayers into my flesh. May my knees and elbows never know ash. May my face and hands never know dryness. May my neck never know wrinkles. May my palms and fingers be affirmations saying I love you when I rub myself with these creamy scented ointments. May they make me as soft as I am strong, as moisturized as I am realized, as fragrant as I am free. And uh, this next one is uh, called, and I will, I will close with this one, it is called uh, Inner Teenager. So I did my inner child and I also explored my inner teenager here. So my inner teenager feels restless about the unknown we are walking through. She is pacing all over the house, trying to come up with a plan to fix every worry. She paces anxiously, blurting out fragments of a master plan, saying things like, this is how we will start a business. This is how we will get a new job. This is how we will find a new man. This is how we will lose weight. This is how we will read a hundred books. And this is how we will get three more degrees. She is making adult me very anxious. She always took matters into her own hands. When my parents told her she was too young to work, she snuck out and got herself a job anyway. When my mom told her she was not supposed to do that, she said, ni modo, empiezo la semana que entra. Too bad, I start next week. She even forged my dad's signature on the work permit. It was easy, they both do their M's the same way. My mom lectured and yelled at her, but had no choice but to accept it. My dad was angry at her for the forgery, but he admired her. Her decisiveness, her work ethic, her resourcefulness, all made him say, ay mija, te pareces tanto a mi, you look so much like me. Adult me tells my inner teenager that it's okay. Yes, we are both upset about having gained so much weight. Yes, we are both worried about not having a job, but we've been able to live in leggings and bra free for the last six months. Let's not ruin the sweet liberation of our boobs today just because we don't know what will happen tomorrow. All right, uh, and with my last minute, uh, I was looking for possibly a short one to do. Um, I don't think I can find it. So um, with my last minute, I'll just do a couple of plugs of things. So um, I'm an educator and a poet and a storyteller um, and I, uh, have a uh, website called Off the Clocker, and I do, uh, you know, poetry and uh, educating and workshops. And um, one of the things I like to do on my website, I have a merch shop, which uh, will be linked here for you all. But um, I like to put poetry on my uh, on inspirational merchandise like coffee mugs and journals and T-shirts. And so, um, if you are interested, uh, you can you can find uh, more there. Also, more about my poetry on my website, offtheclocker.com. Um, and I post new weekly poems every week uh, as well on there. So thank you all so much for having me. I will go ahead and turn it over now to uh, Sarah, who will be next. Hi, thank you so much. And thank you, Diane Funston, for featuring me and Shantae there at Upasada Arts for letting me be here. My name is Dr. Sarah Oktai. I'm a chemical oceanographer uh, who's kind of new to poetry, but as I've been uh, a poetry host for about 15 years, uh, helping my husband, Len Germanara, run poetry venues around the country. And I have a brand new book called Sifting Light from the Darkness. And Shantae has been kind enough to put the link uh, for it, which is very interesting expensive uh, uh, for both Kindle and Amazon in the chat. And uh, it's great to be here. I'm going to start off with a couple of light poems, um, kind of talking about the pandemic. First one is called Laguna Creek Walk, the Pelicans. The white pelicans at Laguna Creek seem out of place so far inland. They remind me of the skipper in Gilligan's Island, big white belly, preening their feathers, they will swatch you with their captain's caps if you let them. A sweet childhood memory of inventiveness, silliness, and community. We all thought we were going on a three-hour tour 12 months ago, but we are still stuck on the island 
with nothing but a coconut radio to squawk into, and no one is listening to the professor. So the next one is called Physics Playground. I'm not a physicist, I'm a chemist, so if you're a physicist, just forgive me. Uh, physics Playground. Muons race past the neutrinos to get to the jungle gym first. They shake their fists as the sparks fly when they grab the handlebars. Neutrinos don't care. Long thought to be massless, they strain to outrace the light, interact with the other lepton cousins. We both love physics. At least I think we both do. I certainly do. It is elegant, non-controversial, straightforward, necessary. Without it, we all fall down. For comfort and coziness, Len and I watch reruns of The Big Bang Theory every night. We have seen each episode about a billion times. But still, we settle in for the one routine that makes us happy in these days without end within four walls. The next one is an oceanography poem called The RV Pelican, describing one of the oceanographic tours I've done for my research. 20 liters, 20 liters, 20 liters. The water piles up in acid clean, 20 liter, high density polyethylene jugs. Surrounded by seawater, we must bring our own double distilled, ion free, extremely pure fresh water. Water so pure it cannot conduct electricity. Hundreds of liters in total queued up along the starboard side of our 123 foot vessel, the research vessel Pelican, named for the island we launched from, nestled in a lobe of Galveston Bay. Argon and nitrogen gas tanks roped tightly between pipes. Giant benthic landers crowd the deck, ready to deploy. 100 meter long spider-legged net to close upon their curled prey. Gangway tied up, we sail out in awkward disjointed lines to mine the sea for data. Drunken sea-legged walks down musty gray painted corridors at 0300 coffee ingested, boots and vests donned, you stagger out onto the deck, tether yourself to standpipes during high seas, push out a 2,000 pound rosette of racked 50 liter Niskins on a hydraulic cable, swinging over the work deck and lower gently into the sea, like the corpse of a loved one floated out into the Ganges. Curtains of inquisitive squid dart like frantic ghosts left and right in the spotlights. 100 meters down in the impossibly clear water, you can still see the rosette. The CTD transmits secrets of salinity, pressure, and temperature as it sinks down a mile or so over the next four hours, trapping giant gulps of water at chosen depths. Finally, raised up on the work deck, streaming sunlight in tendrils of water later that afternoon. Steel box container lab on deck houses special experiments, sequesters radioactive tracers, zombie students and scientists hover over laptops in labs inside the main cabins. Buckets of saltines and ginger ale keep us going. Ice cream is pretty much the only treat. Giant sediment grabs, benthic bear traps hurled to the seafloor, snap shut upon impact somehow gently bite into the soft gray mud and bring up its secrets. The entire ship will be coated with salt when we return two weeks later, satiated, ready to pour over our treasures, find out what stories the sea has to tell. The next two poems are about skydiving, which I have done once with my family, with both my brothers, and I loved it. Uh, we did a tandem accelerated free fall um, with about 12 hours training. So you have two people near you, but you're not attached to anyone. First one's called Skyfall Number One. Curled in a ball, not from fear, but from necessity, in this tight four-seater plane with the rear seats removed. Four of us, packs on, goggles tight, Helmet straps checked and rechecked, face backwards, stare at nothing, miles up, tick by. Rotating your shoulder, meerkat peep, Kilroy is here to peer through streaked window, framing cirrus-laced blue sky. Drone of the engine, some ominous, ominous coughs of the carburetor, shouting to be heard. Everyone plays plane twister, right foot blue, jockeying for position. Door opens, 
wind whips through the cabin. 12,000 feet below you, the world spread out like a surreal map. Rene Magritte Landscape, The Art of Conversation, 1963, Person in Keyhole. Time to go, the sign says. Shut up and jump. So you do. Seamlessly connected with sky, no feeling of falling. Jumpsuit flutters breathlessly. Rushing air gently buffets you. You're a human kite, bolstered with bookend companions, acting as strings. Teapot dance, reaching for ripcord. Drilled instructions unfold. Flow innate from the part of your mind still working. Plummeting to earth, altimeter reads 11,000 feet, 10,000 feet, 7,000, 6,000. You wave off your security blanket and pull. This is easy. Seconds later, ripcord in hand, then stuffed down jumpsuit, you crane up, stretch your arms in a sun salutation as a yellow, blossoming, rectangular shoot appears. You look for the Disney cartoonist filling in the cell. Drifting down, you've become a balloon, a child's toy. Peaceful minutes slip by as you swoop down. Shoulders become giant's wings. You mimic hawks flying lazy circles in the air. Landing pattern, turn 90 degrees, cross turn into the wind. Now the ground is real and coming fast. An expansive green conveyor belt. Arms flung down, closing the flaps. Crucial moment, bum rushing the ground. The second one is called Skyfall 2. Blue box, cirrus clouds, door opens, wind whistling past your ears. Pop, whoosh, float. Hypnotic, rippling, ripstop, nylon, parachute. Your first jump, eyes wide, pulse gallops. Swore you'd never do it again when your feet hit the ground. Sky jumping is easy to repeat. Anticipate the climb. Tolerate the sweat. Check the altimeter. Savor the quiet. Love, well, that's another story, full of heroes and villains staked out crosswise in the heart, jostling for position. 1960s Batman episode, pow, bam. Backstage, the fog machine sputters, obscures the footprints from ghosts of past relationships. They rattle their chains, straining to break free, eventually float away, untethered. One step and you're gone. Gravity is in charge now. High anxiety. Twilight zone, black hole, pulling in the detritus of years. Hypnotic black and white circles spin on the turntable. Neurotic doilies litter the coffee table. The first step is a doozy, but you take it anyway. And next poem I'm going to do is the title for my book, Passing. Sifting Light from the Darkness, and it's about my parents, or at least my father, uh, and then my mother, and you'll see. We scrambled up a small hill, taking a shortcut to school, looked out over the playground, see every face reflected, moonlike, a panoramic sea of blankness. Every child was staring at us. Was it engraved on our faces? Our only thought was to avoid being different, blend in with the ones with fathers. The funeral seemed like a party at first. Everyone is so nice. They pat you on the head, murmuring platitudes, carrying casseroles. Loss is an elephant in the garden, trampling the roses. Almost two decades later, she follows him. To a better place, they say. You doubt it. She wanted out, committed slow suicide. She was really tired, always. She never got a chance to meet you. She would have liked you. Your dry wit, sonorous voice, and voracious need for books, an addiction she fed to the exclusion of all. I am my mother, mainlining those same books. I am my father, driven, affable, a born optimist, straining light from the darkness, running fast on loose rails, best known through news articles, degrees, awards, and other inanimate things. My parents were hardworking, kind, smart, but confused, unsure of their roles, tired of expectations. Warmth surrounded them. We were a family. This is what I tell myself. 
Some of it is true. Years later, I sift through yellowed news clippings buried in a chest under piles of books. A stratigraphic layer of stories emerges. Hidden talents are disclosed in black and white. Rumba dancers, cartoonists, lovers of tennis, scientist, artist, mason. I'm constructing a diorama of misremembered, idealized tableaus with shadows passing as parents. Okay, and two more left. Next one is called Imminent Domain. Fuchsia slice of sunset, sing siren enticement. We exit our wood grain boxes to wander gray branch paths of mud and vines lined by, with winterberry sparks of red. Trails claimed by deer prints, littered with rabbit pellets. We mourn left wing of doom blue jay, tough apos, hawk's dinner, last flight of broken loon. Stratum below grass carpet reveals wooden foundations, charcoal fires, liquid feasts, and seed compacted. 2,000-year-old body in repose, awakened by scrape of shovel, grasp of inquisitive hands. We have to know who lived here, whose spirits we hear rustling in the wind, which bones belonged to the beach and the sand, which bones belonged to the salt spray, and which ones should be interred on marble slabs or laid beneath carved slate in ordered rows within town gates, taken by eminent domain. That's about my life on Nantucket. And the very last one is going to be a fun one about our new dog, which is an Australian Shepherd. Very last one. Thanks for joining us tonight. Mr. Cool, I really admire our Australian Shepherd. I think you would call him a dog's dog. He epitomizes cool. While our 11-year-old Labradoodle chases a tennis ball around our postage stamp backyard like a crazy cornball Buster Keaton on speed, our six-month-old puppy, Mr. Cool, sits down every chance he gets to chew on a stick more Steve McQueen than James Dean. I'd let him drive my Porsche. He trots into my office while I zoom for the eighth time this day. He pulls up some carpet, plops himself down, crosses his legs, and proceeds to stare into the abyss pondering his next teething victim with a plum. His cunning eyes betray more than the average dog's thoughts. I think I detected a wee tear the day Sean Connery died. Thanks. And there you have it. Another evening with Poetry Square. Um, all the corners filled. And I want to thank my guests, Roger, Diana, and Sarah, for a wonderful evening of diverse poetry. And next month for April, we will have Marge Merrill from upstate New York and Tom Lynch from Tehachapi, California, and Jack, um, Jacqueline Smithson Howard from Sacramento. And thank you again, everyone and have a good rainy evening out there. Good night. <laughs>